Good morning, and thank you for coming back to the virtual Big Day in for week five. I'd like to begin by acknowledging the traditional owners of the lands on which we meet today across Australia. I'd also like to pay my respects to elders past and present. My name is Shorju Das Salmon, an intern at the ACS Foundation, and I'll be your virtual Big Day in co-host for today. Today, we have two amazing presenters with a wealth of experience in current and future technologies. We'll be hearing from Jeff, Asia Pacific Senior Business Analyst at Johnson & Johnson, and Antoinette, who is the Head of Operations and Communications at the Australian Space Agency. Remember, you always have the opportunity to ask questions of either presenter, no matter how trivial you think they are. Just hit the Ask a Question button on the bottom right, type something up, and we'll take care of the rest. First up, we're going to hear from Jeff, who squeezes every minute out of his day with a career in IT and continuing his passion for technology into the evenings and weekends. Driven by doing what others say he can't, Jeff is breaking the mold, pushing stereotypes and making the most of today because it cannot be repeated. Working as an IT manager for a global medical organization, he also uses his spare time to talk about his passion for technology across TV, radio, in newspapers, and online in his podcast, Technology Uncorked. So please, join me in welcoming our first presenter for today, Jeff Quattromani, with One Life. Look, thank you so much for the introduction. It's uh, it's, it's very nice to hear all of those things. Uh, my name is Jeff Quattromani, and, and I'm, I've called this presentation One Life mainly because I think it's important to remember that the 17th of June, 2020, the day that we're in today, uh, we don't get another chance at repeating this day. So when the day is finished, uh, we don't get a chance to restart. We don't get a chance to go back and make any changes. And I really think remembering that when you wake up every morning that you've got one chance to tackle this day, uh, it can actually change the way that you actually go about your day and how you start to think about what's really important to be focusing on in your life as well. So uh, that's where I really want to take this presentation today. Now, a little bit about me. Um, as mentioned, I'm an Asia Pacific IT manager. Uh, I have a role that stretches across uh, the entire region here, but uh, I also am a technology commentator uh, after hours. And you know, most of my time in the evenings and things like that, I, I will spend time writing for publications that you'll see on screen, uh, on radio, or even appearing on on TV, whether it's on Sunrise or or, or Seven News. Uh, I've put the word international in front of it because I have started to expand into other countries where uh, once a week I'll, I'll speak on Singaporean radio, and that's always a lot of fun, and recently appeared on TV in Malta as well, which is where, where my parents originally uh, migrated from. So a little bit of insight into what I do during the day as well as what I do in the evenings in my spare time as well. This is a picture uh, of where my parents grew up. Uh, this is in Malta, uh, just near Europe, a little bit south of Italy, if you, if you haven't heard of this little island before. Uh, they were farmers. They were farmers. They had no idea around uh, the technology that we'd ever be seeing today, or even that their kids would one day have an interest in technology. Uh, after they got married, they came to Australia, and, and that's where I showed up and my brother and sister. And, and we had a different upbringing because when you've got parents who are not used to technology and you start to get exposed to it as you grow up, it can be very difficult to try and communicate what you're learning with your parents and then potentially even think about how you're going to communicate your career aspirations when it's not something that they've worked in that field before either. So I think for a lot of people, it was expected that I as a career would move into uh, plumbing or building or have, have an apprenticeship outside of year 10. Uh, that did not happen, and that's that's one of the things that we'll discuss as well. Uh, this is a quick photo from school, so you'll see that uh, I'm the one in the middle with their thumbs up. Uh, I had a great group of friends at school, and I absolutely loved going to school every single day. For me, it was a fantastic social time. Uh, as much as it wasn't meant to be all about social, it was meant to be educational, I was actually quite a poor student, and I, I would hear about Pythagoras' theorem and things like that, and I didn't quite grasp why it was important. Uh, instead, when I did walk into computing studies classes and IT classes, that's when my eyes would really light up. And it's where I got a completely different energy than I would from any other subject that I attended. And that's when I really realized 
I think this is where I need to be. This is where I need to be focusing on. Um, and, and that's where you would see my grades improve as well. I certainly had better grades in those uh, information technology classes compared to science, maths and others. So not a great student, also left with a very poor HSC result. So um, look, I'm standing here today still alive and that's one of the great things that you'll know that even if you don't succeed through your HSC, um, it's not the end of the world. And hopefully hearing from me today may give you some insight as to you know, just how much it's not the end of the world. My career path has been interesting and straight outside of school as a you know a pretty poor student, I was hired by the schools. And that's a very strange thing to go through where um, you graduate year 12 and then in January, you're walking back into the school back into the staff room. Uh, it was quite quite a strange thing to do. So I started off in a traineeship learning about um, breaking and fixing computers, uh, how I can actually repair, keep networks up and running and things like that. I loved it. I loved the fact that I could tinker with the hardware again. Unfortunately, being in schools, you're usually pulling bananas out of the back of computers. Uh, back then we had balls on the bottom of mice. Now we don't, but we'd always find them missing. Students, uh, as I knew, uh, didn't respect the, the the products that were always there. So a great way to start my, my career. Uh, I did go through TAFE and I'll talk about that later as well. And you'll see I've had this interesting career where I've started from support and now I sit as a manager. Uh, but along the way, we've had some interesting changes here. Going from a consultant where I would visit people's houses or small workplaces to do you know odd jobs and different tech things that they needed. Then moving into an in-house support role, I worked for a water tank company that were uh, nationwide in Australia. And during the drought, an amazing time to work for a water tank company because everyone wants to buy one. What we found is that when it rained, uh, we would stop getting phone calls because people didn't think they'd need to um, have water tanks if it was raining. Eventually, that, that business completely went bust and they went into receivership. And for me, uh, in my role, it was quite a bit of a shock because now I need to think about, well, now I need to go get another job before things really um, fall apart around me. And I landed in a medical devices company uh, called Synthes. Uh, I started as a service delivery lead and that was managing their, their whole network across Australia and New Zealand. And that was then acquired by a company called Johnson Johnson, which most of you probably would have heard of. And I've had three different roles at J&J in a short period of time with them. And I think one of the great things that I've learned about um, large companies like J&J is that career opportunities exist within the company. Um, a long time throughout my career, you would find yourself in the IT position and there wasn't somebody above you and there wasn't people around you for where you could actually expand your career. So you had to leave the organization to go and get that next step. Uh, I've loved my career at J&J &J and it's been amazing to, to experience that. The other thing I'll mention before moving on to my next slide is that when I first started in IT, uh, data and analytics was not really a spoken about term. We knew what data was, but analytics didn't have much of a focus. And um, one thing that I can share with you looking at my career here is that you can't predict where it's going to go. Uh, making a 10 year plan is, is almost crazy to do when it comes to technology. It's ever evolving. Next year, there'll be some sort of announcement or some new trend where you'll need to start to pivot and shift to always embrace those new trends to make sure that you are relevant uh, as you go through your career. And I'll talk about that too. Now, inside data analytics, you would think normally that it's just about numbers and tables and things like that, generally boring. Maybe you're picturing an Excel spreadsheet. Um, what I did, given that I've got a passion for technology, was that I took data and analytics and thought, well, how can we consume data differently? And how can you be innovative around that? So the Amazon Alexa product was coming into Australia at the time and I thought, wouldn't it be cool if we could ask Alexa about our sales figures for the day uh, inside the business? And we built that and it was very easy to do, but it was great to put that inside the managing director's office and say, look, when you walk into the office in the morning, you can actually just ask what your sales figures are without turning on your laptop or anything like that. In the same sense, we looked at virtual reality and said, gosh, I like VR, but how can we apply VR to analytics? Well, we thought, what if we could look over Google Earth uh, through VR? And as we looked up and down, it would navigate the globe. But as we did that, the sales figures for those countries would start to pop up out of those countries. So we did that too. And then we realized that our managing director started wearing an Apple Watch. And we said, wouldn't it be cool if when you woke up in the morning, you could just look at your wrist and see the sales figures? 
and we did that too. So I think when you start to think about different ways that your career is going to go and different things that you're interested in, don't think that if you're inside a particular department that your role is pigeonholed into just what it's traditionally about. Always challenge the status quo, always think outside the box. And I think, you know, these three examples are ones that I reflect upon as how we were actually innovative in a space that probably didn't seem like it could be an innovative space. So always think about that. Think about what's happening in the consumer world and how you can link back to that when it comes to your enterprise. My education, uh, leaving school, I ended up going to TAFE. Um, I, I did say I had a career immediately after um, leaving school, but I still went to TAFE after hours, did my certificate three, certificate four, some of the basics to get myself, um, you know, a little bit of credibility as to where I stood. I did my diploma and I did both, all three of those courses in a two year period. So I really chunked it in so I could try and get up to speed. A lot of my friends were going to university as uh, doing IT degrees there. And, you know, I was already getting my hands dirty, but I still needed to try and get some of that uh, collateral behind me as well. My degree I started doing uh, around five or so years after leaving school. And I think, you know, you can always go back to university. Don't think that you have to go immediately after finishing year 12. But for me, it was what I kind of needed as a ticket to get to that next level uh, in my career. Just having that piece of paper or having that credibility really did help me. I did certainly learn a lot along the way as well. You do learn a lot more about how to be a bit more formal in the things you do. Um, when you are used to just getting your hands dirty, sometimes you don't speak eloquently or you don't actually use the right words uh, when you're having discussions with senior leaders of a company and that can sometimes put you back as well. So university gave me a twofold way of speaking business as well as translating back to technology. And I think when we think about IT today, uh, what we need in Australia are people who can speak two languages, talk to the business as well as talk tech. And when you can put those two things together, you've got a really valuable position where you're sitting between the business with business problems and generating business solutions through technology. So that's where my university degree certainly helped. My personal path, this one's a little bit exciting. Being in IT, usually where someone will come up to you and say, hey, you're in IT, what phone should I buy? What laptop should I get for my kids? That sort of thing. Well, I received that question a lot from day one. And I thought maybe I should, instead of going one to one, I should start to do one to many. I started up a YouTube channel. Uh, I, I amassed around 2 million something views during the period that I had that channel open, basically just taking anything I could get my hands on and talking about it in front of a camera, posting it online and crossing my fingers. Um, I started off looking at the basic things, power boards, or the phone that I had in my pocket, the webcam that I was using to film. And then companies start to reach out to you and they start to say, hey, we've got an event in New York where we're launching a new smartphone, can you come? And that started to change things a little bit. It meant that I could actually do more than just look at the things around me. Companies wanted to give me products to test and talk about. I ended up moving into community radio. I absolutely loved you know, speaking to an audience that I couldn't actually see, almost like today, uh, but talking about technology, playing some music as well. I then moved and joined forces with another couple of people where we started a website uh, looking at lifestyle and technology. So that meant that I was actually reviewing Teslas and driving them for a week and then writing about it. Um, but again, also being flown to other things. I was being flown to a Grand Prix overseas or being flown into Singapore and places where I almost never thought I would actually visit. And as a result, I've been to most continents in, in the world just through this. Um, fortunately, they also fly you and pay all your expenses, but it does mean that I still have to report on these events, almost like you would if you were a, um, you know, a person who writes for newspapers for a living. Now I, I've moved into a space where I, I, I talk about technology on national radio, I uh, had a camera crew here yesterday from Sunrise that will be on, on air tomorrow morning. Um, and and every every day I've got something coming through where whether it's the Australian newspaper or it's news.com.au uh, asking for me to write something or review something for them. Um, in the space behind me, I've got some sound bars that I'm testing. I just had a TV get picked up yesterday. Uh, it's a fun hobby for me and I know that this can be a career for a lot of people. For me, this is just my way of staying in touch with technology. Um, and using it to actually help my career because I'm seeing what if what is coming out to market the minute it does or even finding out about it beforehand uh, and then helping bring that into, into my day life, which I absolutely love to do as well. Uh, some quick photos here. You'll see a spot from uh, when I was on the Today Show, uh, my, my son and I in the 2GB studios in Piedmont. Um, my first article that was printed in, in the Australian and a screenshot from my podcast, uh, Technology Uncorked. This is something that is my own. Everything else that I do is for other organizations, whether it's TV, print, online, whatever. 
Uh, this is the one thing that I have that's mine, and I get to talk about technology on a on a weekly basis uh, to anybody who decides to tune in to that as well. Because I do think podcasting is important. I think it is a growing a growing space. Now I do think it's important to give back, and I say this. Um, to, to you today because you don't have to wait until you're retired or until you're very old and successful um, to start giving back. I think for me, as soon as I left school, I started to realize that the people who are younger than you, the people who are earlier in their career than you, they're always looking for insights and they may be actually afraid to ask for it and actually going forward and, and trying to make yourself open to, to help people uh, actually helps yourself as well. It's a great feeling, but you might actually find that one day I could be somebody I'm talking to today. I could be working for you in a few years time and I'm completely ready for that. Uh, in the top left corner is a program that I now run at my school. So a failed student decides to come back and run a technology program. Um, it was something I wanted to do. I started funding it. I, I, have, I have funding to um, cover the prizes that we give away. And it's just a challenge that we expose to the kids to say, let's go and develop something with technology and the winner gets an iPad. Uh, it's something that I love to do and it's in its sixth year now. Um, again, going to schools and talking about technology and careers in IT, but also I have a partnership with, with Red Dust, which is an, an indigenous charity uh, where we get to go out to remote parts of Australia where there is no technology, uh, but we get to talk to them about education and health and things like that. So it's just another thing that I love to do uh, and engage with people and how we can actually help because we all can. Uh, even you watching today, I'm sure there are there are people in primary school who, who might who might need help getting into high school, that guidance, that, that little bit of help and advice you can give, it just helps people. Now, some messages to take home because I have talked a lot about myself and uh, let's give you guys something to, to take back. First of all, you're really fortunate and I don't know you personally, but I can tell you that if you're in Australia today, you are one of the luckiest people on the planet. Uh, we are so lucky to have the networks that we have, the, the amount of free resources that we have at our disposal. One of the first countries to come out of this coronavirus as well, which is amazing. But it's also important to note that uh, in this era that you're living in today, you are so lucky as well. Uh, we didn't have the internet as much uh, when I was in school. I couldn't always Google things. I had a set of encyclopedias I had to look at. It was terrible. So if you want to learn something, you type it into Google and you watch a video, you read about it. It's that simple. Yes, your teachers are fantastic and I, I'm sure they're hopefully nodding in agreement, but quickly jump onto Google. Anything you're looking to learn, you can be doing that on the side. And I think we are so lucky with the amount of resources that we have today. Now, you can do it. I love this little saying because uh, growing up, I was told a lot that I couldn't do things, uh, whether it was because I hadn't gone well in school or whatever the case may be, or even just people may not have believed in me. Uh, but I want to say that you can do it. And the reason being is that, again, with Google, if you go online and you think about something you're aspiring to do, type that in and look for people who have done it already. There's a pretty good chance that someone has already done what you're hoping to do, whether it was, in my case, wanting to one day be on TV to talk technology. Yeah, people like that existed and they're actually upset now that I'm you know, stealing some, some of their airtime. But anyone who looks like you or sounds like you or has the same gender, whatever it is, I'm pretty sure you'll find someone who's already done it. And that means that you can too. And I think that's an important thing to remember is that it doesn't matter where you've come from or what your gender is or anything like that. Trust me, if you really want to do something, it might won't happen overnight, as they say, um, but it certainly does happen or you certainly get very close to it. Now, sadly, you're all being replaced. Uh, I'm being replaced. Uh, robots. Robots are coming. They're all here. The first one on the left uh, is stacking boxes in warehouses for us today. Uh, you'll find these sort of robots produced by Boston Dynamics, some amazing videos you can watch. Uh, they're stacking shelves. The top left corner, you'll see a shopping center in, in the US where you walk in, you pick up your groceries, put them into the trolley, and you walk out. It's that simple. Um, there is no cashier, there is no checkout chick to do that. It's that simple that you that you now have technology replacing all of that um, simple motion that used to happen where somebody would scan the groceries for you. The drive-through, this is going to be really interesting, and I apologize to anybody who works at McDonald's today. However, they are working very fast on replacing the drive-through with voice recognition and artificial intelligence so that when you drive up to that speaker, and you, at the moment you think you're talking to somebody, you are, but eventually you won't know that it's not a human being taking your order. You'll be talking into a system, the, the system will take your order, you'll drive to the next window, and yeah, someone will probably hand it to you, but that's one less person that they needed to actually be listening to your order. Hopefully it gets it right, and I'm sure McDonald's will test it properly before they deploy. 
the top right hand corner is the Uber of the air. Uh, this is coming to Melbourne actually uh, in about three years time where you'll be able to fly to from Melbourne City to the airport and vice versa. Eventually this will be unmanned. So those people who are driving taxis and things like that, you can imagine autonomous drones where you'll jump in them and it will fly you to places that you want to go. This is coming. The, the robotic dog, this isn't going to be your next pet, but this is the sort of product that will go into dangerous situations instead of human beings, uh, such as the bushfires, to do some navigation and to send information back. Now, this isn't to really scare you. This is to tell you that there are exciting opportunities because people need to develop all of these things. People need to support them. People need to design them. There is a lot of jobs that actually do get created for everyone that is replaced. And I think that's an important thing to remember is if your career was to pick up the lettuce and scan it through, that's a very limiting career. But if you can focus on the technology that replaces that, that's an exciting and prosperous career that you can be planning for. Being comfortable with the unknown is something that I certainly had to do growing up. And, and I think a lot of people need to do the same. Take, take the coronavirus, for example. We didn't really expect the impact it would have on our working life uh, when, it, when it really hit Australia. We sent every employee home. Everyone had to start working from home immediately. So that kind of change really can be unsettling for a lot of people. But take it a different way. Take it for the person who used to develop apps for BlackBerry. Now, a lot of you may not even know what BlackBerry is. They're a really successful smartphone, smartphone company. And Apple came in. Uh, Android came in through Samsung and others. And imagine if you were developing for BlackBerry and ignored the change that was coming from, from Apple and others. You potentially don't have a job today. So always being aware of what's coming, focusing on what's coming towards the future so that you can be prepared to pivot and twist and even relearn and reskill is extremely important. You know, when I worked for a company that went into receivership or, you know, where people were losing their jobs, you had to be ready to adapt to that change. And I think the more that you can get comfortable with change, expect uncertainty, uh, it'll lead you to a better result. For example, I'll go back to that coronavirus example. Those who could successfully work from home quickly had better results over the last few months. How you could start to connect virtually was very important, whereas some people were so enamored by the fact that they couldn't see and touch people that it limited the way they could work. Start now. So important, guys. I know that you're in school. I know that schooling is extremely important and please don't stop your education process. However, if you have a passion for something, if you have an idea of where your career might be after school, start learning about it now. Start even getting your hands dirty with it now if you can. Whether it's through work experience, connecting with people who are already in that type of role that you're aspiring to one day be in, connect with them on LinkedIn, ask them questions, maybe seek out a mentor. It's really important to start doing that. The other thing I'd recommend doing is start to have almost a public page, have a way that you can present yourself when your resume starts to be sent out. Because what employers do is they Google you. They will Google your name. And I'm not saying to make sure your Facebook page is set to private. I'm saying to think about what can you show recruiters and things like that a little bit more about you and what you've been doing beyond just school. Because guess what? Everybody has been to school. And if you go to university, you'll be competing with thousands of people who are graduating from that same course. So what can you do to set yourself above from them? An extremely important thing to start thinking about how you can do that. I went straight into Q&A, guys. I'm so curious to hear from you. I want to take any questions, anything you've got, whether it's about my career, my personal life, um, I'm open to it. And again, I encourage you to keep in touch. If there is any questions after today that you are maybe too shy to ask, but I hope you do today, uh, you can always reach out to me on any of the social platforms that exist out there as well. Absolutely. Um, perfect. So we've got a few questions uh, lined up. Firstly, I'm going to start with what's the most exciting tech event that you've been to? I would say Samsung tend to put on some of the best uh, technology events, I think. Um, I haven't been to an Apple event yet, um, not one overseas. I've been to plenty locally, but yeah, Samsung do a pretty good job. They put on the fanfare more than more than other brands. Absolutely. What advice would you have to students who are considering starting either their own podcast or maybe their own um, tech YouTube channel? Uh, honestly, it would be just just do it. Um, I think for a lot of people, and especially when I started off with my YouTube channel, I was so focused about the camera that I was going to use, the editing software, uh, or the name that I was going to give my YouTube channel. 
just go ahead and do it. I think even if you're using a, a simple webcam uh, and the microphone that's built into your headphones, whatever it is, start putting content out there. The quality will improve over time regardless, but don't wait six months to launch, launch now. Okay, just on, on, on that topic as well, um, what's, what's, what's the name of your YouTube channel by any chance? <laughs> Uh, it was just G Quattromani. That's how that's how good I was at coming up with a name. It was my uh, first initial of my first name and my whole last name, which was extremely difficult from a marketing point of view. I mean, someone has to know how to spell that to begin with. So <laughs> you can see how much thought I put into it. But again, when people search for videos online, um, the username doesn't matter as much. If they're looking for review of Galaxy S20, that's what they're going to see. So absolutely. Where um, so we'll sort of move pivot towards technology a bit more now. Where do you see um, augmented reality and the hardware surrounding that? Um, do you know anything about that? Where do you see that uh, moving towards? Yeah, I, I think augmented reality is still in its infancy. Uh, I think we're starting to see the hardware support it and people are getting familiar with it. If you think about um, Pokemon Go, for example, what a great way that was at getting people excited about augmented reality. People didn't know the technology was even doing that. They were just playing a game. I've seen augmented reality used heavily in marketing at the moment. It's an amazing way to take your phone out, point it at something, whether it's a car in a showroom, and then through your phone, you're seeing the internal components of the car start to pop out. A quick example is I went to the Formula One Grand Prix in Melbourne. Uh, I sat inside the Mercedes garage with glasses on with augmented reality, and I watched the Formula One car in the Mercedes garage explode and show all the parts inside it. And so many different ways you can use AR. We just have to be creative in how we're going to do it. Absolutely. I'm um, sort of on, on that on topic as well. We hear a lot um, in the media um, like lately as well about like VR and virtual reality and the uh, um, potential um, solutions that that could unlock. What do you think is the most um, exciting uh, future capability that VR holds? I think it will be gaming first. I know that we're already seeing it in gaming today, and I think it will stay there for a little while. Eventually, it's probably going to move into, into medical and surgery. I, I think we're going to get to a point where a doctor will be sitting in Sydney and they'll be operating on someone in Wagga Wagga um, using VR. They'll be doing that probably through a HoloLens type experience, holding controls, but actually controlling digital surgery equipment in a hospital over there. And that's enabled by a VR as well as 5G. So uh, we'll have a, we'll have a few more as well. Um, we'll sort of move more towards career talk now. Um, what opportunities do you think there are for mature aged entrants in ICT? And what would your suggestion be for those looking to maybe make a career change who are a bit more mature than just high school leaders? Yeah, look, I, I don't think age is as much of a barrier as it used to be. I think given that we all live in this virtual world now, you can't see age most of the time. If you think about now, I'm working from home until the end of the year. I'm not going back into the office. Um, it's only if I turn my webcam on that people know how old I am. Um, and the other thing to, to note as well is that the borders don't matter anymore either. So if you think about a job that you've always wanted in Silicon Valley, you can probably still go for that kind of role. Yes, you'll be doing different hours in Sydney, but um, don't think about borders, don't think about age. Um, the other thing to note is retirement is still set to around 60. I think people will work into 70s plus. So old is not old anymore. People used to think that 40 was old. I think Colonel Sanders started KFC when he was 50 years old or something. So there is there is no no better time than now to, to keep moving. Perfect. Um, thanks, thanks for um, coming to our virtual event, Jeff. And it's actually really interesting and good to hear from you, not on the TV or on the radio, but actually be able to talk to you and ask you some questions. My pleasure, anytime. Cheers. I hope that there are also a lot of emerging technologists um, who are watching today who um, really look up to Jeff and hopefully are looking to follow a path like him, myself included. I know this is great inspiration. As with previous weeks, Jeff's unanswered questions will be posted on www.thebigdayin.com.au later. Antoinette Daly is a millennial and an executive director for the Australian Space Agency, maintaining the operations and communications for the agency. Annie has a degree in engineering and applies these skills to shape the operations of the agency, working with parliamentarians and managing people and culture for the Australian Space Agency. Annie is also responsible for inspiring Australians about the opportunity that space has to offer and will outline today how the government will triple the size of the space industry in Australia in the coming years. So please join me in welcoming our next presenter, Annie Daly, with her presentation, The Australian Space Agency and future opportunities to work in space. 
Uh, thank you so much for that. And Jeff, uh, that was wonderful to actually hear you um, presenting on, on topics that are very much related to the space industry. So I'm very excited uh, to actually hear that um, presentation. Um, my name is uh, Annie Daly. I'm actually uh, one of the executive directors at the Australian Space Agency. I, I am actually a space agent. I'm, I'm not just uh, somebody that comes out and talks to, to students as my full time job. In fact, um, my full time job is running an agency and ensuring that we, we get all the requirements done for government. And I was very much honoured earlier this year to be to be recognised as one of um, the AFR's 100 Women of Influence. But today I'm here to talk to you on two um, avenues. Uh, firstly, I'm going to talk to you about my career pathway, but I also want to talk to you about why space and what's the exciting aspect um, uh, that the space industry is actually uh, just starting to grow right now. And in fact, this is the perfect time. Uh, students at, in, in years from years 10 onwards are going to come into a, an industry that is just booming when you're, when you're ready to, to start. Um, but what you might not know is just how space uh, impacts your everyday lives and how it improves your lives. So uh, I'm just going to show you a quick video that explains that in 40 seconds. Okay, this is Airman from the planet Earth. Since taking that one giant leap, people have benefited from space. Many of the things we take for granted work because of space technology, from GPS location, tracking and navigation. that gave you a little bit of an indication um, about how space is actually part of your everyday lives. Each time you go and pay for something using your mobile phone, uh, each time you use your, your satellite navigation systems, uh, those are just a few of the very small examples of how space is, is enabling your lives to be so much better. Now space, so many people think space and they think astronauts and rockets, but let me tell you what's happened in space in the last uh, six to 12 months. Firstly, um, you'll be living under a rock if you hadn't realized that uh, that the first crewed mission from the US occurred uh, very recently. And what was so exciting about that, it wasn't government that sent um, astronauts to space. It was actually a private, uh, a private vehicle and a private sector company that organized that. And that's the, 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 the approach that space is now doing is it's showing that space is not just about government. It's actually the private sector leading. Um, Hayabusa 2 and an asteroid Rogu has actually got an Australian connection. Uh, right now there's a, a little rover uh, and a little microbe on, on, a, um, on an asteroid that has taken samples and used uh, an incredible amount of robotics equipment to collect samples. And it's actually going to return to Australia um, and land in the Woomera Desert uh, in December of this year. So watch out for that when it hits the news. We've also sent spacecraft to the furthest regions that uh, you know that it takes a good three four five hours now to get uh, signals back from and to be honest uh, the last year has seen so much opportunity in in the private sector um, and and lots of small up and coming uh, industries booming as a result of the space industry um, and i'm going to talk to you a little bit about what australia is doing with nasa and um, and returning to the moon and going on to mars which is just some of the exciting things that have happened in the space um, recently. 
Um, I want to talk to you a little bit about the agency because I know lots of people are interested about what we do, how we do it, um, and we're very much economic driven. So we're not NASA, we're not the European Space Agency. We're actually quite a small, very nimble organisation because the, the idea is to enable the industry to grow rapidly. Uh, this is the time where niche companies with you know specific products, new ideas, new software and technologies, this is where the industry, where we're going to come out and help that kind of industry to really grow and to, to grow exponentially. Um, but we're also about inspiring and improving the lives of, of Australians because not many people realise just how much space um, impacts their everyday lives. The, the, the important part, and I know this is very um, government-y speak, but the important part is that we're trying to create an extra 20,000 jobs by 2030. So if you think about that, that means that if you're in year 10 now, you'll be finishing school, probably doing some extra studies, getting some experience in the industry, but you will be right at the peak when we are hoping to have those first jobs out um, in the industry. And hopefully, uh, if you choose to take a, a career as a space agent, that you might actually take on one of these new jobs that we're trying to, to deliver. Um, the agency itself is very much a coordinating body. So we do have some technical people. We also have policy people, communications people, engagement people, and we're very much about coordinating activities and also making sure that what we do is, is really safe. Uh, if, if companies are gonna go out there and launch rockets from Australia, then we need to make sure that they do that safely. Um, whenever I do come and talk to schools, one of the things I always remind school students is that nowadays you can actually launch rockets with, um, with products and things that you can find in a science classroom. And so we have to be extra safe when we, when we do look at, at rocketry because you know, uh, it's, very, it's very likely that a high school student could very much interfere with you know, flight paths um, in, in their hopes and dreams of becoming a, a rocket scientist. So we here at the agency are working really hard to put the, the, the procedures in place to enable um, development of the industry, but also ensuring that we're safe and keep up with our United Nations obligations. But we're very much about being responsible um, and sharing ideas. And one of the things is that we're only two years old. And as a result, um, our entire structure is very much uh, representative of society. So you will see if you talk to anybody here in the leadership team, we've got people who are quite young, uh, myself uh, being Gen Y, um, all the way up to much older individuals with lots of uh, years of experience. Um, we've also got all the, the, a very good gender diversity being 50-50 in our leadership team. Um, and we're also working really hard to improve um, our di geographic diversity. In fact, in the leadership team, we have two, two of the members who were born outside of Australia, um, who are now Australian citizens. So it's just, uh, we're, we're trying to, to lead by example for, for opening up the industry um, to, to a much wider cohort of individuals. Now, very excitingly, um, over the next five years, we're working with NASA on the uh, return to the moon and to go on to Mars. Now, this is exciting because even in my uh, lifetime, we haven't been back to the moon. Um, and this will be the first time we've been back to the moon since the 1970s, um, which is a very long time ago. Uh, and this time we're going to go there uh, cheaper, safer and, and to actually to stay. Um, and Australia is going to have a very exciting role to play with NASA on that, which means that students, uh, university students and the industry is going to have um, an exciting opportunity to display technologies and capabilities. Um, we're going to do this over the next five years, so keep a watch out, but one of those will be what we call a trailblazer project, which will be something exciting that we hope that we can uh, galvanise uh, support for um, to, to show how important space is. One of the other things we're working on, just to show that we, we don't just do all technical aspects too, is that we're designing a discovery centre that will be based in Adelaide, but hopefully available to, to anybody. Um, and this is a brand new discovery centre that's going to show how space um, incorporates in your life, but also the different types of careers. Because what people don't realise is that the careers in space is actually very, very broad. Um, and, and I'll go through how broad they are. Um, but we're designing uh, exhibits for, for people to, to engage with. And so if you're even thinking of being a science communicator, this, this is one of the um, types of activities we, we're doing. Um, 
on Sunday, uh, we announced Australia's very, very first mission control, which means that the public can come in and see and interact with a mission control centre. Um, if you wanted to see any other control centres, you would have to be privately escorted in. Um, but this one will be the very first one that um, Australians can book in to, to actually utilise. Um, it's now very feasible and has happened quite regularly that high, uh, sorry, high school and university students are actually launching satellites and then they can use this kind of mission control to monitor, talk and engage with their satellites when they're up in space. So this is exciting and it should be developed now over the next three years. I'm going to talk to you a little bit about careers now um, and the types of careers in space that you can, can look forward to, to doing. But I'm going to start with a short video um, one young lady that's been choosing a uh, space career. Oh, I'm Shafin and I'm studying a Bachelor of Aerospace Engineering and Astrophysics at Monash University. Since high school, I've always been passionate about STEM and space exploration. My course is helping me to achieve my dream of becoming an astronaut so that I can work with cutting edge technology and pioneer new ways to explore the universe. I'm also a part of a student team called Monash Nova Rover and we make Mars rovers and compete in Utah. The best thing about my degree is that I get to learn about rockets, aircraft, helicopters, satellites, telescopes, black holes, aerodynamics, and the list just goes on. I want to make my mark on the world. I want to make a difference. My advice to you would be to dream big. Find out what's possible for you in aviation and aerospace. No other career can take you higher. The space industry has um, exciting career opportunities and I'm going to talk to you about some of those different careers because some of them haven't been developed as yet. So this slide has got quite a lot of information on it, so I'm going to try to explain what it is. But uh, the, the Australian Space Agency has kind of seen uh, nine key areas as where we can have um, the most impact. Um, satellite navigation, for instance, uh, across Australia now, if you go into a remote area, you might find that you, you have to rely on a satellite mobile phone in order to get connectivity. What Australia is working on right now is to make it so that across the entire of Australia and within its maritime borders as well, which is a huge area, that you will have um, precision and navigation and timing uh, information available to you with an accuracy of 10 centimetres. Now 10 centimetres is quite small when you think about um, when you think about robotics and you think about uh, driving driverless vehicles, 10 centimetres allows those opportunities to occur. Now what's being made more exciting is that with the expansion of 5G and mobile networks is that in your city areas you'll be able to get navigation precision down to three centimetres. Um, and this this is where it's really exciting. And, you know, when, when Jeff was talking about, you know, doing virtual reality and doing, you know, um, surgeries from a distance, this is exactly what the space industry is all about. So out in Perth, for instance, you've got a control center that's monitoring and utilizing and controlling large machinery out in the Pilbara. And they're doing that safely by keeping the people away from, from those remote and very difficult environments. But if you can do that horizontally, you can also do that vertically. And that means that we can communicate with satellites and use that technologies to move things around. And this is really, really exciting. Um, and Australia is actually one of the at the forefront of this kind of technology. Um, and, you know, it has other flow on effects. For instance, I am um, very excited. I've got a I've got a grandmother that's got seeing difficulties and um, and she, she struggles to get around and to move and, you know, uh, having a, um, an eye seeing dog is just not possible. And hopefully there'll be an app that one of you might create that will actually allow her to be able to cross the road because it'll be able to tell her that there's a car coming, not coming, that there's a slight dip in the road, that there's a little step over here um, or that the wind has changed and it's going to rain very soon. So to, to move now so that she could be home in time. And that's the kind of capabilities that this technology will, will be able to deliver. Um, so that's just one, one area as an example. Um, 
Earth observation is one of my personal passions. Um, I'm an environmental engineer and that's how I started my career. But Earth observation is so important. Um, you know, with the recent uh, devastating fires in Australia, a lot of you would have seen satellite uh, satellite imagery showing the devastation and and how the the burnout regions were occurring. And the technology that we can get from satellite um, communications is really, really vital to to be able to help those kind of initiatives. Um, one of the things I used to work on is in Indigenous Affairs, uh, we would work with a remote community to be able to see and review the impact of, of a dog abatement program where they had problems with feral dogs. And using Earth observation technology, they could actually monitor the, the, the results of all the initiatives that they were doing to abate dogs. Um, and they could see rejuvenation and the, the water networks changing downstream and around. And that's the kind of information you get from, from Earth observation. Um, some of the other areas are very well known, satellite communications. Each time you watch a live broadcast, it's usually utilising uh, satellite technology to, to have that broadcast. I'm sure you've been uh, irritated when you know there's been uh, bad weather and all of a sudden the satellite signal can't get through and you, you're disappointed that you can't watch whatever match is on. Um, but that, that is the, uh, the technology that, um, the, that space provides. We do so much more. Um, one of the uh, exciting areas is that there's a number of really advanced companies in Australia vibing to, to do commercial launches from Australia. And this is still um, a few years away, but the moment we get, um, you know, uh, they're, they're very much working towards, you know, being able to launch Australian payloads from the Australian soil uh, into to any orbit because Australia is so perfectly positioned to be able to do launch. So those are just some of the ideas and I've listed the different types of uh, career pathways that people have undertaken who do can, can genuinely say they have a space career. Um, telehealth is definitely one of those ones booming now because of the COVID environment. Because um, you have to imagine that if you are in, uh, if you are working in space, you can't just take a quick flight back if, you, if you, your appendix, you know, starts causing problems or if you've got a ruptured tooth. So uh, Australia actually leads this because of its work in the Antarctic division and working on Antarctica because for six months of the year you can't just leave. So they're having to, to do different ways of doing health and the well-being. So these are just um, different ideas. Um, I'm just going to give you a couple of profiles of some other young professionals who are working in, in space. Um, ben Tran is from Miriota, who's uh, an up-and-coming IoT a space company where they're planning to, to use IoT devices to, to communicate with lots of sensors on Earth. Um, the same is uh, for, for Fleet Space, who are also doing something very similar. And Fleet actually have launched uh, a number of satellites already into space um, and are, are communicating with their satellites um, and using it for, for IoT um, devices. Uh, Gilmore Space is one of those rocket companies that I was talking about who's de designing, you know, new rocket uh, propulsion systems that are also very much environmentally friendly and uh, can, can consider the environment as well. Um, and of course, um, machine learning uh, is very much linked to, to space technologies as well. And Bo Chen um, is, is doing some wonderful work. In the Australian Space Agency, we've got two young professionals. Uh, we've got quite a few young professionals. We have a graduate that is very much looking at industry uh, requirements and is talking with companies to see how that she can help them to, to, to really grow and expand their opportunities. And Georgia, who works in our space regulation area, is making sure that we comply with the United Nations and particularly for the peaceful uses for outer space. We're doing a lot to try to build uh, the future Space Force and in fact that's my, my big challenge at the moment is that I need to come up with a plan for the Australian Space Agency for how we're going to engage you um, to, to consider taking a career in space because if we're creating jobs we definitely need people to fill them um, and this is a, a high tech um, uh, industry so we're quite keen to, to try to see people who've got STEM skills that can be um, pivoting into, into a space career. Um, and I've listed a few activities that we're, we're doing now, but, but watch this space because I'm most certainly going to add to, to the type of initiatives that we're doing. Um, I wanted to point out a couple of staff members at the Australian Space Agency because I wanted to highlight why space is very different and, and how you can be a part of the industry. So Aud is our Chief Technical Officer. She's had a lot of experience working overseas and has brought that back to Australia. 
Um, she's previously been on NBN on the uh, on the on the satellite networks um, and is now responsible for actually running our, our whole technical program. Uh, Michael spends a lot of time in Geneva with the United Nations, making sure that we are responsible and that we are meeting the UN Sustainable Development Goals as well as you know the peaceful uses of outer space. And this is very very sensitive political uh, wrangling between countries, um, and and can be quite sensitive. Um, space obviously has uh, has got a national security focus as well. Um, and the US has very, very uh, loudly and boldly indicated um, that they've set up a new new part of their defense force called Space Force. SEAN, for instance, is very much about uh, engaging and communicating with um, with people to inspire them to 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 take on science and to to be part of the um, the space community. Um, and she has a personal passion as well for for bringing um, STEM to to students from perhaps disadvantaged backgrounds. So I wanted to show you those three, and then uh, another three that do a lot more on uh, telecommunications and also, you know, uh, showing that the, the different degrees. So Adam, for instance, uh, did your satellite, your traditional satellite communications type engineering degree. Um, Catherine also did um, physics and then went on to specialise in different um, space technologies. Um, you'll see with Catherine, she, she started out in Australia and then worked overseas for, for about five to six years and then brought that experience back to Australia. And she took the opportunity to go and get internships overseas when she finished um, um, school. And we've got another Adam and he leads our strategy and policy area. And Adam comes from a very defence background. Um, so he's using his knowledge of defence to, to help the industry. So whilst we're a civilian space agency, we obviously have very strong linkages to defence. Um, and his experience working in, uh, in defence industry and bringing out defence um, using products that have been used in defence in the private sector, we're going to do the same in the space industry. Um, just on the one of the final um, elements of my, my presentation is, is a little bit about me and what I did. Um, I very much had a passion for space when I was still at high school. Um, the photos on the uh, right hand side of me in year 10 and year 11, um, me meeting an astronaut who came to, to do talks and I went to um, a space camp in year 10. I also went to uh, the US space camp um, when I was about 16 as well um, because I was that excited and passionate um, about all of um, these, like everything to do with space. It just kind of inspired me. Um, it wasn't so much, you know, 15 years ago, it was the, the industry in space was not there. So I had the choice of leaving Australia and at the time that didn't quite suit my, my preferences. But I went to do an environmental engineering degree because the environment really was um, appealing to me. Um, and, you know, if, if it doesn't spur inside you some passion, um, it's, it's not going to, to deliver a career. So I went into environmental engineering and spent a lot of time doing environmental initiatives that um, I thought would, would really help our planet. Um, and, and then it just so happened that, you know, two years ago, all the experience I'd worked in my environmental engineering side of things, the experience I had in government, meant that I was at the right place at the right time to take on one of the leadership roles in the Australian Space Agency. And it's something I'm very, very proud about. Um, and as a result, I spent a lot of time trying to encourage others to, to, to get the excitement of space because it really is something that, you know, uh, it, not everything's being discovered um, and it, it is challenging and it is difficult. And, you know, we've had rocket launches that have failed. And even to this day, you know, a private sector you know, sent a, a rover to, to the moon and, and couldn't land it. Um, and, and it just shows that space is not one of those conquered um, industries yet. Um, one of the things I would say to, to any uh, aspiring uh, future space agents is that uh, it, your career path does not need to take a traditional high tech career pathway. Uh, the industry is really, really broad. Um, it's really important that you do take on some STEM subjects so that you can really understand the, the technologies. Um, but if you're more into the communications, the, the policy, the, the, the regulations in the United Nations, those are all the types of skills that this type of industry really, really do, does need. Now, the things that uh, gave me a little bit of a leg up when I was at high school is firstly, I, um, I volunteered and joined every type of space group I possibly could. Um, I, I, I sank in and I enjoyed um, all that kind of information that was coming to me at these groups. 
I volunteered and, and participated. And most importantly, I did things that I really, really love to do, because if you love it, you'll find a career path that will that will make uh, make it grow. Finally, don't be afraid of taking part in competitions. You might not win them, but the experience of going through it is really important. I can tell you right now, nobody cares about what competitions I won when I was in high school, but the experiences that I learned has definitely helped me to, to this day. Um, we do a lot of cool stuff in the space agency. There, this is such a new industry and it's an exciting time. So I, I really do encourage you to, to look into a career in space. Um, and at that point, I might leave it um, and open it up for questions. Yeah, perfect. Um, interesting to hear from what the space agency actually does in the role of space in the future. Just the first question here we got. Um, did you want to be an astronaut when you were a kid? And do you have any future aspirations yourself to go to space? Um, I really liked the idea of being an astronaut and then I saw how little that they got paid and, and how much studying I needed to do and I realised that I wasn't a type of person that was going to have 10 degrees. Not that they have 10 degrees, but they have at least, you know, three or four degrees and they're really specialised in an area. So I decided I wouldn't uh, become, become an astronaut, but I would facilitate an environment that would enable it. And if I got offered a ticket to go to space, hell yeah, I would be there. So I'm looking forward to the space tourism market really, really opening up because whilst the tickets might be about <clears throat> 200,000 now, that's what the cost was for the first aeroplane flights. And now they are a lot more cheaper and available. So that's the <clears throat> exciting part. Yeah, actually, no, the, the next question we've got sort of follows along those lines. So what do you think um, is the future for space um, as like for the civilian population? And do you think that you'll see a day where most people will be able to visit space at least once? Um, we think about people that were born in the 1930s didn't realise that they would be able to travel from Sydney to, to England in 24 hours, and now they can do it in 18 hours. And they didn't imagine it, but it was possible. And my gut feeling is that this, this is the time right now because we're seeing space move from being big government projects to actually being industry led and industry does it faster, quicker, more efficient, and that actually can actually make money out of this too. So I, I think that uh, come in the next 15 years, we'll be going from, from Sydney to, to the UK, having our meeting at, you know, lunchtime meeting and then turning around and being back to, to put the kids to sleep at night. And I think that that's going to be a really very real proposition. Uh, the space industry in Australia is still so new that we're we're right at the cusp. So the the US and a lot of countries might have been ahead of the game for us, but we're right at that really exciting point where we can support the industry. So I feel like this this is the exciting time. And in fact, ten years from now, I think it will be like an exploding industry. Okay, bold prediction. Um, <laughs> What is your view of where we might achieve global internet coverage using satellites? Um, I think we're almost there already. I, um, I know that um, uh, there's about 422 Starlink satellites already uh, in space, which is part of um, SpaceX's dream to be able to, to do global um, broadband. And we already get um, our internet. I mean, uh, prior to COVID, if you have been on an aeroplane and connected to, to the Wi-Fi and connected to the internet, you're using satellite technologies there. Um, so I think that that's the way of the future and it'll be an, a, a normal part of life to be getting your internet from, from satellites. Absolutely. Sorry to the NBN, um, but fiber is still important. <laughs> um, it's still another offering. It's just that I think that the, the technology and the ability to move data will be much faster through satellite connections. Absolutely. And um, final question just related to the um, Discovery Centre that's meant to be opening in Melbourne. Do you have any idea when that's going to be open? <laughs> All right, so it's not opening in Melbourne, it's opening up in Adelaide, um, which is in the Lot 14 precinct. And that's actually where a lot of space startup companies are based. Um, but watch out in March 2021. Uh, it's only nine months away and I better get a wriggle on and, and deliver it. <laughs> <laughs> Wonderful. Um, great to hear from you, Annie. And I think the future of the space industry, uh, pardon the pun, is only going to go upwards from here. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, the sky's no longer the limit. <laughs> uh, 
Yeah, along with um, Jeff, Annie will be also answering any of the remaining questions that she didn't get, she, we didn't have time to get to her um, for, and we'll make sure to post her responses on the Big Day website. Don't forget also to check out the ACS Foundation's Career Wheel if you want to find out more about the variety of roles in technology. The link will be available on your screen now. We'd also like to thank all the sponsors who made this virtual Big Day impossible, along with our two amazing presenters, Jeff and Annie. We hope you all took away something from, we all hope you took something away from this week's virtual big day. Next week, our presenters are Richard White, CEO of Wise Tech Global, and Curtis Black from Animal Logic. The link for the 24th of June session with Richard and Curtis is on screen now. We'll also email this link to all your teachers for those of you still watching at home. Don't forget, if you want to rewatch this presentation or presentations from previous weeks, that they'll be put on our website later today at www.thebigdayin.com.au. Just click on the past events tab and select whichever one that you want to watch. I look forward to seeing you all next Wednesday at 11 a.m. Australian Eastern Standard Time. Until then, stay safe.